know this the B, the O, the Y, L, E, the H, the E, I, G, H, T. Now at the S, that's Los Angeles. Relax, kids, mezcalito about it. Stuck to these streets like some chew gum, fool, what rhymes I spit out. Flavors used up like new drugs, living out my dreams. Walking DMT, stalking a weak MC. Stop talking, you ain't popping, you ain't dropping no quality. Only dropping the stock of the scene, please. We literally had to bleed to be where we be. Seeking therapy for drama endured, revolving the worlds, an endless storm full of drama and scorn. Palm in my corazón, palm in the fruit of my labor, knowing my worth. You'll know it too when you sit across my table. Now salute, so too ready to die, so alive I stood. Uh, my name is Fabian Gabora. I was born in 1975, came here to Los Angeles in 1980. I was five years old when I first arrived, when both my parents decided to migrate from El Paso to Los Angeles, you know, due to the you know, immigration status of both my parents. We landed in the housing projects of Aliso Village, Pico Aliso, just is east of the river. And growing up in those housing projects, it was during the 80s. And so at that time, as a child, you know, you start to wonder, you know, what can go wrong as long as you're with your parents, but did not realize that I was going to come into a neighborhood full of uh, uh, gang-infested neighborhood, drug addiction, and, you know, the violence, uh, full of violence. And so growing up in these projects, and trying to sustain your innocence, yet already with the obstacles of having both parents who are immigrants, and you have no coping skills as you're trying to make sense of things, and it's very difficult. And so growing up in these projects, you know, my thing was not to be a gang member. It was never a career choice. It's just due to the traumatic events that start to happen in my life that I start to see things different. I lost hope at a very young age. I remember my father trying to do the best he could with what he had, my mother as well, but my father then became a drug dealer, which then led him into a career of incarceration. This way, I, and this, I was growing up as a, on my own, you know, without a father figure. Mother, a single mother, so there's a lot of disparities already at hand. And so then they say, go to school, get an education so you could be all you can be, at least that's the American dream. But the impact of trauma was already in place. And for me, growing up in the projects and always being told not to do what I love to do, in this case, which was art, breakdance, pop lock, you know, I used to do that as a kid. That was my escape. Uh, but the gang members and the gangs that played that environment would not allow us to partake in these, you know, breakdancing uh, and, and, and graffiti art and so on. So, you know, always being told, don't drop, don't do this, don't do this. And that, to me, was very demeaning and you know frustrating as a kid and you don't have no coping skills so in the end what do you do i made some choices that put me in a turmoil which was to join a gang For me, that was like the worst mistake I ever made. I did not know what that came with. I just knew that it felt right in the moment. It was a refuge. It was a way for me to be seen, acknowledged. It held me, even with my traumatic, my baggage, they received me. But it comes with, with uh, conditions. And that's when I started to realize that I was no longer my own man, that I had to follow suit and do what it is I must do in order to gain some sense of credibility, which in the end of the day, I realize now it was all a myth. But bringing it back, what helped me during these times? One thing that has helped me was I found and discovered this gift, and this gift was art. And ever since I was six years old, I would doodle and sketch how to draw Mickey Mouse, how to draw Woodpecker. And when my father will come home from prison or he'll be out, there was a lot of domestic violence disturbances. And my mother would scream, no, shorty, no me golpes. And I can feel inside me just like shaking and angry that I want to protect my mother. But as a kid, there's not much you can do. You're confused because you respect your father, you respect your mother. And, but at the same time, you can't allow this to take place. So I would jump in between my mother and father so he wouldn't beat her. And that to me start to become overbearing and overwhelming. And my father then told me not to be stepping in and don't get involved. So what I did then do as a coping mechanism was to go and hide under a coffee table. And my mom had an old antique coffee table with a long drape. And under that, I would get my notebook and I would start to create my own worlds to escape my reality. Art, it gave me hope, it gave me meaning. And no one's gonna take that from me.
gave me that hope. And I kept utilizing art no matter what. While in gang culture, I was doing tattoos. Before gang culture, I was doing graffiti art. And, and, and then after that, eventually, you know, I was going to be sent, you know, caught up in this web of violence along the rotating door in and out of incarceration. Um, eventually, uh, Father Greg stepped in, you know, I was in East Lake Central Juvenile Hall. They wanted to give me three years in youth authority. Uh, at this time, Father Greg tried to convey to the judge that I had a talent and I had a gift. And the judge was able to pay attention. And all we had to do was prove to the judge that I had a gift. And the judge did take it upon himself to give me a second chance. And my conditions of probation in that time were to go and see the East Los Streetscapers, which was Wayne Healy and David Wodeo. And I remember as a kid, I was young, still gang member, and I was about 17, 16, 17 years old. And, you know, at that time there was no resources, but Wayne Healy and David Wodeo stepped in. And when they stepped in, Father Greg brought me to Palmetto Studios at the time. And that was when the beginning of a lot of things took place. Because when I saw the murals that these men were painting, these artists, Chicano artists, I was like, whoa, this is exactly what I yearned to do. And that's when uh, they took me in. And I was one of the youngest East Los Streetscapers back in 1993, I believe, or 94 around that time, and start to learn of what it was like to drop the spray paint and pick up the brush and understand the the mediums of acrylic and how to, uh, you know, start to lay out the storylines. And then this time the storyline was that of the Chicano movement for our people. And yet I was trying to understand how do I take my story and tell that story. And that was the initiation of the art world. And behind that, eventually because of their of their mentorship, then they then I start to meet other artists such as Yor Chiepes, Yolanda Gonzalez, and these were all great pioneers, but I didn't know how to embrace that because I was young, still gang involved, I'm still about the hood, but yet information and, and people were in front of me of 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 talent, of of rapport and credibility. But I, I really wasn't seeing that. Eventually I met Ernesto La Losa as well, gave me a few opportunities and so on and so forth. And as, as I went on, I could not deal with my trauma, my pain, so I kept relapsing. Even though I did three years with Wayne Healy and them and gave me everything I needed in order to proceed in this career of the arts, I still had a lot of pain that I wasn't dealing with. So I then resorted to drug addiction. After I started to utilize drugs, I progressed eventually into methamphetamine, where I start to lose my mind. By this time, I had my wife and children, and I start to lose that relationship. They took my first child away at, the, at six months. My life wasn't changing because I wasn't ready and willing to deal with my pain and my suffering, my demons and all that that I experienced as a young one. Lost sight of my art, but I still kept trying and doing it, but I wasn't really in, in, into it. But eventually I had a near death experience where I tried to kill myself. I had two suicide attempts. And uh, the second suicide attempt, I had slid my wrist here once. You can see here I have a big scar where I tried to kill myself because the voices were getting so powerful and they were taking control of me and I could not live with the guilt and the shame of the pain that I'm causing to my children. It was the same sharp blade that my father instilled in me. And now I'm doing the same thing. So I could not live with that. And so eventually my mind and my voices told me, you gotta kill yourself. Care yourself. So I ran across the 5 South Freeway here in Boyle Heights, ready to end my life, and that's it, I'm done, no one loves me, all that. And just when the truck was bound to hit me, there was a spiritual awakening that took place. Something that goes unexplainable, but it felt right. And in that near-death experience, I realized and understood that there is something much more greater than myself. In this case, my God. And it was because of that experience that I decided to go and turn my life around. And I went to rehab, got the help I needed. Once I got that help, I realized you still got that tool, and that tool is art. So I came to Homeboy Industries back in 2007. I went to rehab 2006. In 2007, I went to Homeboy. I was hired for the very first time. I started to work on myself by doing recovery, the 12-step model of recovery. Uh, I started with AA. And then gradually I start getting more into therapy. I have my therapist who will help me organize these thoughts and emotions, remove me, help me remove myself from the guilt and the shame. And then the pain, I start to paint again. And eventually as I was painting, I start to open doors for myself gradually because of my own recovery. And 
after being a homeboy, I went back to school and I got state certified by the drug uh, by the state of California as a drug counselor. And to me, that was the biggest accomplishment ever because I've never finished school, never got my high school. I did get my GED in order to go to this college to get a certification as a drug counselor. Once I was able to do that, I started to understand the 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 way we think, the way we the mindsets and the belief systems and and the, you know the trauma. And once I was able to understand that and gain the, tr the therapeutic lens, the clinical lens, I say, how couldn't I implement that alongside my art and, and with my lived experience? So now I was on to something. Now I have to develop something. And keeping in mind that there is a lot of homeboys and homegirls that, that are still out there who struggle, who are still experiencing some of the things that I've encountered as a child. How do I intervene? How do I disrupt that and hopefully create something that's gonna develop some access and or, or a space where they too can find their gifts, their strengths, with hopes that they can help us and help themselves to make this world a safer place. So with the introduction of Wayne and David and what they did for me, later through the mentorship of Vincent Valdez and what he did for me, and through my own experience and opening doors through my art, I said I need to recreate something that is gonna provide the same platform for those system impacted, formerly incarcerated, gang involved, homeboys and homegirls, who deserve a second chance. And that's when Somos La Arte came to life. And previously to that, being a homeboy, I started to initiate an art school, an academy. And the academy was just that. It was designed for homeboys and homegirls, system impacted, to come and explore, connect, heal, and then hopefully discover their talents and then help them to package or at least to feel the confidence enough to promote them in such a way that they too can get into the art world, you know, in a sense as I have. And luckily uh, I've been successful and luckily I've been given a second chance. And you know, it's all through mentorship, bro. Like I think if it wasn't for like Wayne Healy, David Botteo, Father Greg, Vincent Valdez, and other folks in my life who really took the time to listen and to really hold me in the times of trials, then maybe I wouldn't have found uh, that sense of worth that I needed in order to rediscover my truth and also redirect my life. So thank God behind all that, today I have Somos La Arte uh, and that's a vision of mine and so far we're growing and it's amazing to watch man how you know at one time over here trying to kill myself, hopeless, not thinking that there is a better life or a better future, not knowing that my art matters because I used to think, well this is prison art. This is cholo art. No one wants this Chicano stuff. And, you know, that was a belief and a mindset that has been embedded with me through my own turmoils and my own traumas and lack of confidence. But I say, no, no, no. Wayne Healy and them said, no, 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 no. You got it all wrong, bro. Your art matters. You have a skill. You have a, you have a voice. Now paint, it, paint about it and put it out there. And so far, so good. And, and they were right, you know. It has opened many doors. And all I want to do, man, is just to be able to do the same for others. Give back to, uh, give back freely what has freely been given on to me. With that being said, welcome to Somos La Arte, and I will show you around uh, on what it is, the Art Academy. A space for you, a place for those who are really seeking a refuge to help better themselves, as well as to master their craft. So now that you've learned a little bit about me, um, we're walking now to the back of the academy where we have Obed. And so today we have the privilege to actually be able to hear from Obed and his story to kind of inspire us and give us a little window to the importance of the arts within community as we try to continue to create this access. What's up, Obed? My name is Obed Silva. I currently live in Whittier in uh, Southeast Los Angeles, but I'm originally from Westminster, California in Orange County. My family is originally from Chihuahua, Mexico, and that's where I'm from too. I was born in Chihuahua. My family moved from Chihuahua to here uh, a decade before I moved here, but my mom and I came here when I was one year old in 1980. Family means means everything. Um, it's 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 where the support is, is where the love is, is where the nutrition is, is where the nurturing is. So, family is everything. 
So my main obstacles came with uh, joining the gang. Uh, I joined the gang when I was 14 years old, and with that just came a lot of pain and suffering. Uh, getting involved with, with drugs, getting becoming violent, going in and out of juvenile institutions, and eventually into jail. Um, and at 17, being shot myself when I was 17 years old, uh, being shot through the back and being left paralyzed. At 18, a year after that, I would uh, shoot a rival gang member in the leg, um, but I'd be charged with attempted murder. And I fought the case for about two years and was out on bail for, for those two years. Uh, but it was at that time that my mom, she took me to community college and enrolled me. And um, that's when I started to really reflect on my life and started taking education seriously. So in about eight years after enrolling in community college for that first time when I was 20, uh, I was able to get my AA degree, my bachelor's degree in creative writing, and my master's degree in English literature. So now I'm an English professor at East Los Angeles College, and uh, I've been teaching for the past 13 years. Well, community being Mexican, Mexican-American community um, is a big part of our family. Um, in every particular neighborhood that we've lived in, we've always been really cohesive with the greater community, whether it be the neighborhood or the city itself or just the family. Um, now, for me, you know, being a professor at East Los Angeles College, uh, my community has broadened. So it's no longer just my family, my community in Orange County, but now I consider, you know, East Los Angeles and Boyle Heights as uh, part of my community as well because my students are my community. So um, my community just keeps growing. It just keeps um, expanding. They were my support system. You know, whether it was my aunts, my uncles, or, or my grandparents, my, my abuelas, and my mom. Uh, you know, when, when, when you grow up and you come from an immigrant family, it's hard to be part of the larger fabric. So you always fall back to your family, uh, to your roots, because that's what you know and that's, that's, that's what recognizes you as part of them, as part of the culture. Uh, so my family was always there for me. You know, I'd come home from school and grandma would have the frijoles ready and the food ready at home while my mom and everybody else would be at work. So everybody played a role in raising me. The way I define culture is, number one, it starts with your roots, where you come from. So for me, culture begins with my Mexican roots. Uh, after that, it extends to the family. So how does, you know, what's the culture within the family? And of course, it comes back from the Mexican roots. So it has to do with, with traditions, with comida, even with the way we speak, the way we dress, the way we engage with other people, right? And what that means is that everybody in the community becomes your family because in Mexican cultura, that's the way it is. Well, the connections between my culture and my art are, are very connected. Uh, one complements the other because um, I tend to paint you know, people in my community, things that I see that are part of my culture. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll paint, um, you know, part of the lowrider community. Uh, I'll paint part of our religious community, um, even some of our gang-influenced uh, community. So everything that I see in my community is pretty much what resonates in my art. Uh, well, number one, um, it, it, my father was an artist, but um, he never followed through. So that was my first influence. Uh, my second influence was the person who was his mentor, which was Aron Piñamora, a famous muralist in, in the northern part of Mexico and the southern part of the United States. Um, so that visually, that was my influence. Uh, here in Los Angeles, it's Fabian Devora, who um, has not only influenced me visually, but physically in um, 
you know, in practice and educating me with particular um, skills and techniques that I otherwise wouldn't have uh, had access to. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to pinpoint the, 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 the first moment that I wanted to pursue art because really I think that happened when I was a child. Um, I loved to draw as a child. Uh, you know, when my dad was incarcerated, he sent me pañuelos with like Disneyland characters that he'd hand draw on them and I'd copy them. Um, but it, it, it didn't fall through because, you know, I asked my mom to enroll me in art classes and it was just too expensive or to buy me art materials and that was just too expensive. So it was something that I had to put aside as a child um, as something that was unrealistic for me to pursue. However, uh, now as an adult, uh, having a career, I'm able to buy my own art materials. And um, so about two years ago, I, I, I bought myself some canvases, some, some, some paints, some brushes, and um, I just went at it with the canvas all on my own. Uh, but by also, you know, observing the works of other artists, you know, going back to Fabian de Bora and looking at his artwork and just by visually looking at it, whether it be online or at some of his um, uh, exhibitions. Uh, and now, you know, I have the opportunity to be here and working in his studio and getting some of his feedback and some education from him. So I'm pretty, I'm trying to take it pretty yeah. serious now. Well, well, the first thing is the thinking process is coming up with the image, right? Because you'll see an image on the street, like you'll see a, a, a lady sitting in a certain way, whether she be at the bus stop or just in some random place. And you look at her or, or him and you'll be like, damn, that's a, that's a dope image to put on a canvas. But then co comes the conceptualization part of it. Well, what goes with that image, right? Uh, so it's the thought process, thinking about it first. And then after that, maybe sketching it out. Uh, after that, maybe, you know, now with the, with the we have the advantage of Photoshop. So kind of creating the image there. And then finally, I mean, putting it on canvas and getting the brush to the paint and the brush to the canvas. Um, so there is uh, a, a linear process that goes, uh, that, that runs through it, but it all begins with the idea. I mean, right now my motivation is to get as good or close to being as good as my mentors or, or people that I aspire to paint like, right? Again, so like my father, Aron Piñamora, Fabian Devora, other LAR artists or muralists. I don't, I don't have goals of like um, selling the works or being recognized, you know, statewide or worldwide or anything like that. It's just the joy of painting and having at least one person to appreciate it, be like, damn, that's pretty dope, man. That's, that's enough. If you have a goal, if you have an ambition, if it's just, you know, just a desire to, to create art, you, uh, most of us have access to a pen and pencil or a paper, uh, paper and pencil, and um, you can begin there. I mean, I've seen wonderful works of art be created with just a paper and pencil. And um, we, as a beginning, you could work from there and just work your way up after that. Uh, this series of works is um, because, you know, being in a wheelchair and being a gang member or ex-gang member, um, I've come across a lot of uh, people who are also in my situation. So homies who have been shot and left paralyzed uh, because unfortunately that's, you know, it's part of the culture. It's part of the lifestyle. You know, they always said that you, you have two options when you're a gamer is to die or, or, or to go to prison. But there's a third one, you know, you could be left paralyzed and in the wheelchair. So in this series, I wanted to kind of like show love to the homies that are in a wheelchair now uh, who can no longer stand up. And so what I wanted to present was, you know, the, the homie in the wheelchair, but also him standing up in the background and uh, kind of like connect his legs to how they once were and how they are now. Um, 
and again, it's just to to show love to them, to show them that they're being recognized, uh, because often they're just being you know, left on the margin. Hope you guys had a engaging time in listening to both these stories. You know, everything that we try to do, it's always to try to ignite hope, bring inspiration. It's also to demonstrate to the outer world, the non-believers, that change is possible. Hopefully this was a little glimpse and a window to what it is, the endless possibilities that can come regardless of our obstacles, our challenges, or the situations we may be in. Thank you for joining us, and there will be more to come. And remember, there is a resource out here for you, and it's known as Somos La Arte Homeboy Art Academy.